Well, hi, good morning, and thanks so much for joining me here in my shop. I'm about to start on this really cool-looking clock radio here. Um, let's take a look at it. Now, I, uh, if you're watching my videos one as I post them, if you're a subscriber and you watch them as they go by, then you know the last couple videos were on this very large 100-pound prototype AM-FM thing. Uh, I've decided not to work on that project after examining it uh, just just so you know uh, you know so you're not so disappointed to see me stick my head inside that thing you know I don't know the brand I don't have any schematics for it I, I don't know what's going on I don't even know if those are the right tubes that are plugged in it so uh, it really it would not be wise for me to invest time and effort in that ultimately that thing is worthless anyway but wow, look at this this is cool it's got a neat look a nice chrome look this is kind of a 1950s kind of automobile look to it, sort of. A nice big clock. You can read that from across the room. A little hard to see, but it gives the date and the day in behind here, which is quite unusual in these older clocks like this. And it has a nice AM radio. It's a Westinghouse uh, radio in it. Um, and it's in great shape. Uh, it's not bashed up in any way. A little bit of cleaning and polishing, and I think it'll look just like new, in fact pretty close to new. A little scratched up here from fingernails and stuff dragging in the plastic when these things are being turned. That didn't feel so good. Okay, there's something funny about this. Okay, first bad sign. Next bad sign, I can see the red pointer has fallen over down under there. Can you kind of see that? Let's try it. Well, it's moving, but for some reason it, it's cockeyed. What's that tell you? How would it get bent like that? Right there. I don't know if you can see it, but right here it, it goes, so it's not in the right spot on the string. I don't think it should go all the way to the right, so that's what's happened to that. Yeah, I can see it's stopping here. It should be stopping over here. Okay, um, this actually looks like it has a sort of a, a spider like spider web like crack to it. I don't know if that's visible in the camera or not. I think you have to be up here where my eyes are. And now you can see that in this area here, it's actually finely cracked or maybe surface scratched. I'm not sure. The other angles you can't see it at all. Okay, Mr. Westinghouse, what do you look like from behind? Okay. Oh, you've got an extra switch. You've got two incorrect screws, or at least one incorrect screw and two missing. I don't think I'm the first guy to look at this radio. On-off switch. Now, usually these switches are installed because the clock won't turn the radio on and off anymore. And so this is a secondary switch. To operate the radio. Look, it has an outlet down here too, which is a little bit unusual for a radio like this. I guess the theory is um, you have a, a lamp plugged in beside your bed and that's consumed your outlet space, I guess, and you can bring in this radio and keep your lamp going by plugging it in here. I don't know if that's really the case. It says 1100 watts, I guess, for that. And you don't, use, don't plug your iron in there. Well, I think our first move is to uh, uh, open this guy up and look inside. Oh, a little more news here. There's the model number, 5T12-1R-2. Canadian Westinghouse, made in Brantford. Brantford, Ontario. Tube socket should be filled as shown. <laughs> okay, made in Canada. Let's fill those tube sockets. Let's see if they're filled. <laughs> Anybody fill the tube sockets? A little 
along. Now, oh, this is probably just wires from the back of this up into the radio. Is that it? That's all it takes? Two screws? Looks like that's all it takes. Here it comes. And what is it? Speaker out the back. Hey. Westinghouse Telecron. 48 bucks. Clock works, no alarm. Radio turns on with loud hum and doesn't get much reception. Okay, so that's actually a really good sign. It means it actually receives something. And it hums a lot, and we all know what that is. Okay, so big on-off switch, great big cable. Looks like something's been put together here with a grommet. You hear it, hear it rattling in there? A grommet. It's not the best. Let's see if we can get this out of here. So when you see things uh, done with the, uh, I call them uh, grommets. It's probably not the right word. But the uh, you, know, you twist the wires together and you put the plastic cap on and twist it down like on your house wiring. When you see that in a radio, that tells you something about the person who did it and uh, their knowledge of and access to parts, equipment and everything. Basically, it, there wasn't any. So there's a guy grabbing something out of his garage. Now, I'm not trying to knock it. Um, by hook or by crook, if these radios get, 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 uh, get their lives extended into the future, then a good thing has happened to them. And uh, I wouldn't want to discourage anybody who is not sure what they're doing to not do this. I mean, look at me. <laughs> and we all have to start somewhere, right? Okay. Let's see what we got here for a radio now. How to pick this one up right by the chassis. So pretty dusty in here. Nobody's taking the time to remove the dust. But you can see it's knocked away here, knocked away here, this from hands maybe. Uh, capacitor's nice and clean. Okay. Antenna's here. That's a rubber band. That's what's left of a rubber band. I'm pretty sure these rubber bands lives are reduced because normally when you use a rubber band you, you put it under some tension right to use it and under tension it becomes chemically active and gets under attack probably mostly by oxygen and eventually you have a, uh, a cracking failure so all the tubes are there uh, everything looks right nothing looks bad speakers in little tiny speaker but it's in good shape Appears to be in good shape. <clears throat> I was saying to my wife yesterday while she wasn't listening, it's amazing to me that all these old radios, most of them have speakers that are in pretty good shape, really good shape. I find that really surprising. You'd think the paper cardboard cones would all be shot, and, and some of them are, no doubt about it. But way more are in good shape. So surprising. Because of course that's a killer, right? If the speaker shot that's it for the radio pretty well unless you can find a brand new speaker otherwise you're stealing the speaker from another radio you're just passing the death you know down the line well it all looks really good let's take a look underneath I think I can lay this guy right on his face here let's see what's under there hey not much to begin with so 
that's going to be causing the hum, no doubt about that. It's got one of these packaged uh, capacitor network, resistor network parts in here. Um, capacitor here, which to me looks like a replacement almost, but maybe not. One capacitor here. It's got some uh, cer ceramic, it's got a fair number of ceramic capacitors in it, but really only the one big paper capacitor I can spot. So this should be easy. Um, we knock the hum out with this, and the radio may be ready to go. Let me just get rid of that. Maybe deal with this one. Yeah, this guy shouldn't be too hard to do. Uh, no reason to be afraid to start him up here, especially under you know, shop control. And see and see what it really does do. Let's give it a go. We'll find out if the clock works. So the switch currently is off. First thing is to find out is off is off really off. I mean a switch like this, yes. It's only got two poles. It, it's gonna work. So when I throw the switch, nothing should happen. And what do you mean nothing? Nothing should happen. These lights should not come on. In fact, I gotta take out this bulb. That forces all the power reaching the radio through this. Through this light. And if you can see it, you kinda can, you keep your eye on this. Here we go. So, no bulb light, 123 volts, full voltage here, so the switch is definitely open. Now, is the clock going? Have to be careful now because we got 120 volts sitting on this thing, which is kind of floating around here. Look at that, the clock is running. Oh my gosh. And an awful lot of these, the uh, the clock won't run. And you know what we're going to have to do? Before I go any further, we have to do a radiation test on this radio. And see if it's radioactive. Now, can, can you... Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I'm going to do that right away. Okay, now some of you know exactly what it is that's made me do... You know, prompted me to try this test. This is just a battery that I use. This is my Geiger counter here. Switch it on. And you're going to have some trouble seeing the screen here, but it comes up with some words. Welcome to the BR9B semi function type radiation detector. Push L to start it. Now, if we're quiet, if we're quiet, we'll hear it as it picks off what are probably mostly gamma rays. We'll just listen for a second here. pretty safe in here. So normally if you leave this long enough the average will come out to around 13, 14, 12 in my house, something like that. So that I would consider that to be background radiation. I don't think I have any problems with radioactive gas in my house here. I have one radio that is radioactive. The dials are radioactive on it. Now this one when I look at the uh, dials I can see the white paint on the ends and I can see it much more clearly with my own eyes. It looks like the radiation stuff. So now I'm going to hold this close to here, and we're going to hear what the difference is, and see it on the uh, on the instrument too. The pickup, uh, the the Geiger tube is is located right in this area. From my experimenting with it, that's what I believe. You see, it says 22 now. Um, you know, this number is the instantaneous reading averaged over, I don't know what period, the average will be calculated down here where it's blank. It hasn't been on long enough to produce an average. Here we go. It's radioactive. And 
we'll try the, the lower pointer, but I mean it's we just kind of go in between them. So my other radio is much more active than this one. Uh, well, I shouldn't say much more. It might be double. The surface area that's painted is actually much smaller. Well, you can see the chart it's painted. You can see the huge rise on the little graph there. It's gone off scale because I'm sure what it's suggesting is if you're in an environment and it's that high, you're in a bad, a bad way. Now, if I just pull this a short distance, it, it, it well, it, it may still be a little bit elevated at this distance. So what's important about this is not getting irradiated by the dial here. What's important about the and, and throwing this out, no, it's not a really big concern. What's important is you need to know that that's what it is. So you don't take the plastic cover off and maybe take a cloth and start wiping it to clean it and you don't realize what you're cleaning. And then you get it on your fingers and then, just like the virus, you stick it in your mouth. But you don't want that to happen. You do not want this stuff in your, inside you. Outside, so I think this is a selling feature of this radio. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to have one and bring your friends over and go, look, look close, see close, radioactive. Now let's try something really crazy. I think if I hold my camera up close to this, it may it may show up in the camera. The radioactive uh, radioactivity may show up right in the camera. So to do that, I'm going to use the other camera here. Hey, I didn't think I'd be doing this this morning. Okay, let's switch to the other camera here as soon as I get it going. Capture device cannot be found. Okay, so I got a little problem here. I'm going to have to sort out. How come you can't find my camera? I'll stop and fix it. Okay, so uh, we're going to start by trying this little camera. I have another camera that's actually been altered to pick up uh, cosmic rays. We're going to bring it in and we're going to try that other camera after I try this. So first we're just going to use the camera as a camera. Let me change the focus on it here. If you just bear with me. The autofocus won't uh, won't be good enough. Okay, let's take a look at this with the uh, close-up camera here. Let's see what this looks like. You see definitely kind of a brownish color on here. And uh, you see the dot? The dot is the same material, so they've, they've got this uh, radium paint on the dots, but not on the numbers, just on the dots. I guess the paint was probably expensive. I think it's just uh, somewhat deteriorated. You have to imagine that if you have a radioactive material mixed in with paint, the paint is taking a beating uh, chemically from the radioactivity. Like it, the radioactivity would beat the paint apart. And uh, it's weird, kind of weird looking. It's got little holes in it or speckles in it. Oh, I wonder if any of that is kind of flaked off or. Uh, if it's if it's uh, friable, that would be the word for it. Then the stuff would end up down, uh, laying around down here. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, and and what about what about these words? No, they're not going to waste the paint on that, and they're not going to waste the paint on these either, because nobody's going to want to read. Look at how cracked this thing is. The whole thing is uh, stre uh, stress cracked checking maybe you can call that but this isn't radioactive paint here so we're gonna have to also take a look at this in the dark and, and see if this glows at all huh. well let's try that next I, I can darken it down really good in here starting with that continuing with this just close the door here it is dark Okay, so I'm looking with my own eyes too. And yeah, 
I can't imagine there's any glow there at all. Let me just put the uh, camera on it. Oh. Yeah, let me change cameras again. There. So now we're looking in the uh, close up camera, but it's going to have the blue light is a LED on the camera itself. So, you know, there's a number and the dot doesn't even appear. And then where's the pointer? So, so there's no there's no glow coming back from these things at all. Let me look again with my own eyes here. Nah. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing nothing at all. Okay, let me just fill in the dark here. There we go. <laughs> it's pretty thoroughly dark in, in here. Okay, pretty interesting. Uh, not terribly critical. Let me get my other... Um, I was going to say, let, let, me, let me get my other... Ooh, what are you looking at? Totally out of focus picture there. Um, I have a camera that's been altered to be sensitive to... cosmic rays. I have some software which will also uh, tally up cosmic rays. Oh man, I don't know if I can make all that work. Let's carry on with dealing with the radio because I kind of have forgotten I got it plugged in too. It's a little hard to forget when the clock is running. But we're one inch away from trying this radio. One inch. Volume must be down. Tuning, absolutely. Sleep, alarm, on, off, on, off, nothing. So we'll throw that switch back here. Now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the power off on the outlet. Throw the switch. Now I'll turn it on from the my little power control panel here. Okay, now, oh, so the, I saw the light come on, so for sure it's drawing power. It's probably going to be a Big time hummer, as we've been warned. Ready on the volume. Wow, not humming now. That's not a particularly good sign. Here it comes. Yeah, that's a bit of a hummer, for sure. Switch off. Pull the plug. So clearly, the first step with this radio. I'm very excited about fixing this one up because this is going to be a beauty. This is going to be worth some money when it's done. I'm sure. Uh, I don't own this radio. Someone else owns this radio. And uh, so the lucky them. Lucky them. So we're going to change this guy here out it's a 50 uh, 50 it's just a two banger this might be a bike pass capacitor I'm not sure what that is we'll, we'll, we'll check it out more closely we'll take the Hummer out and we'll run the radio again and see if it see if it operates and I'm willing to bet it will okay let me let me change that I'm also gonna, gonna get my uh, cosmic ray sensor in here to get try and get that going Okay, so I've given a little bit of time to try to see if the uh, radiation uh, detection uh, uh, camera that I have here is going to work in this case, and I don't think it will. So this is just a regular webcam. The lens is covered with aluminum to make sure no light penetrates into the actual light sensitive part. What will still penetrate right through that aluminum and through anything from any angle here are cosmic rays, which are shooting through this right now. Cosmic rays is what you'd hear on my, uh, hey, how come this stop? On my uh, uh, Geiger counter here. So well, what is coming out of this uh, radio is uh, much lower energy. Uh, it cannot penetrate to the sensor in this. So we're not going to see anything with this. This will only react to cosmic rays, high power, super powerful cosmic rays that are shooting through us here. So well, what I did find is an interesting uh, bit of information on the Canadian government website. I'm going to take a look at that together and just see what it says about exactly this. 
luminous dials on old radio equipment and things like that. So let's take a look at that. So this is the Canadian federal government's uh, website. And uh, could your collectible item contain radium? It's a long explanation here. Not, not long, it's an explanation of it. And then it, this is more detail down here. So let's go down to the detail. There you see a radium clock. See how fat the paint is here? That's one sign that the, these things look a little bit fatter than they should. Likewise this. So uh, uh, in general, radium luminous devices are not identified as containing radioactive materials. The radium luminous paint was often white when it was new, but would typically tarnish to yellow. So I'm looking at that radium. And it, looks, it looks dirty white is what it looks like to me. It looks like there's dirt on it. Although it remains radioactive for thousands of years, the paint has broken down chemically over time, and so the device may no longer glow in the dark. When they say the paint has broken down, I think what they're saying is it's it's losing, releasing, or dropping the uh, the uh, radioactive particles. I think that's what they're trying to say there. There may be no visible signs that radioactivity is present. That's certainly the case with the radio here. Are these devices dangerous? The radium inside these devices is a naturally occurring radioactive nuclear substance that can be hazardous in certain circumstances. For instance, a potential danger exists from internal exposure to the radium luminous paint. Okay, so internal exposure means you've eaten it. As long as the device is not disassembled or tampered with, the risk of contamination is minimal. Potential hazards can also be caused by large collections of radium luminous devices High levels of radiation can be found when many of these devices are grouped together. For more information, go to the radiation hazards section. Okay. If a radium luminous device is no longer luminous, is it still dangerous? That's this radio. Even if the working life of the device has ended, the radium contained within the device is still radioactive and therefore a potential hazard remains. Over time, the radium luminous paint breaks down chemically and may no longer glow in the dark, but the radium remains giving, given its 1600 year half-life. So this, this, this item here is just as radioactive now as it was when it was new. I think that's what they're trying to say here, 1600? Except some of the radioactive particles may have fallen. Uh, and I guess that would mean that they would be loose and, and kind of dust-borne inside that uh, radio cabinet. So if you took the glass plate off, you can have a little bit of a cloud of radioactive particles floating around. Since we're very concerned these days about particles floating around, this, this kind of fits the, uh, fits the times, doesn't it? I collect vintage wartime pieces. Could my collection be hazardous? Large collections of radium luminous devices may be hazardous. High levels of radiation can be found when many of these devices are grouped together in parts, bins, and cabinets. The biggest hazards come from the intake of radium contaminated paint through ingestion, from contaminated hands, inhalation, breathing in loose radium based paint flecks, absorption through the skin, through open wounds. So, for more information, go read that. How should I handle and store radium luminous devices? Care should be taken when handling radium luminous devices to avoid contamination. The best way to protect yourself is be aware that the hazard is present. And that, that's what I've done. I've made myself aware of it. The biggest risk from radium luminous devices is exposure to the paint. Over time, the paint breaks down, becomes brittle and flakes. A radiation risk can result if the paint is transferred to a person's hands and is ingested. For example, if the device is in good condition and the glass is intact, exposure to this device would pose minimal risk. Simple precautions such as storing the device in a resealable bag, handling the device while wearing disposable gloves should reduce the risks. Oh my gosh, I'm not doing that. Other things to keep in mind. Do not open radium luminous devices. Uh, okay, so I don't think I've done that because the, the dial is contained in its own little, little area there. Minimize the number of radiation luminous devices stored or displayed in one location. As far as I know, I only have one radio with luminous dials. Wear disposable gloves when handling radium luminous devices. Well, I think you want to go a little further and say if you're handling the actual material or an area where uh, particles could could have uh, could have gone. I, I can't imagine handling this radio on the outside is some kind of risk. 
contain cracked or damaged radium luminous devices, contact the CNSC for additional advice. Canadian Nuclear Standards Commission or something like that. Do not eat, drink, or smoke in areas where radium luminous devices are handled or stored. Well, this would have to be an industrial an industrial operation where you've got like 50 of something and stuff like that. Store radium luminous devices in a secure location away from occupied areas. Well, of course, these things are intended by their very nature to be in places where people are so they can read the, the clock dial and that. Elevated levels of radon may also be found where, when radium luminous devices are stored in poorly ventilated areas. Radon is an odorless, colorless, radioactive gas. It's a product of the radioactive decay of radium. Radon can escape from radium luminous devices, especially those without a face or with a cracked or damaged face. Well, well, this one doesn't have a cracked or damaged face. So if, if radon is being produced inside there, there would be high levels of radon inside the container, but that container leaks like a sieve. So, you, 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 so you'd have some elevated amount of radon inside the clock there, but I can't get too high because it's going to leak out. Elevated levels of radon may also be found when radon, radium, sorry, radium luminous devices are stored in poorly ventilated areas. Did I already read that? Over time, the seals on the faces of these devices also degrade, allowing more radon to escape. Well, can it possibly be enough to be concerned about? Radon gas concentrations are found to be extremely variable and not necessarily directly related to the number of devices stored together. Factors include the amount of radium in a device, the condition of the device, whether the radium paint is sealed. Radon gas concentrations are usually not an issue with a small number of devices in a well-ventilated areas. To reduce the risk, store radium luminous devices in well-ventilated, low-occupancy areas. What do I do if I have a radium luminous device that is cracked or damaged? If you have one that's cracked or damaged, wear disposable rubber gloves and carefully contain the device. Seal the container, store the cracked or damaged device away from occupied areas. I mean, the whole concern here is that somebody will accidentally eat some of this stuff. Get it on their fingers and stick it in their, in their mouths. Could dismantling a radium luminous device cause a risk to the person? That's me. Dismantling a radium luminous device increases the risk of inhaling or ingesting radium and the risk of contaminating the surrounding area. Do not open or tamper with a radium luminous device. For more information. Where can I have radium luminous device service? Well, right here at Jim's Radio Shop. Bring it down now and hand it to him. Hmm. A CNN licensed provider. Testing equipment, vacuum pumps. Ay, ay, ay. How can I safely dispose of it? So this will reveal something. How can I safely dispose of this thing? And I plan to, to, to give it back to the owner. <laughs> That's how I'm going to dispose of it. Since these devices contain long-lived nuclear substances, they cannot be disposed of in regular waste streams for equipment or general refuse. Requirements for the transfer and disposal of these devices are defined in both federal and provincial legislation here in Canada. Currently, they must be disposed of at radioactive waste management facility licensed by the CNSC. Oh my gosh, really? By law, this has to be disposed of. Well, you know what I'll do? I'll certainly put a note on the back of it, a sticker on the back of it saying a radioactive dial. Caution or something like that. I'll put something on it so, so anybody who has it would be aware of what they have. These devices are accepted through the Government of Canada, no, no cost. Are these devices still being produced? In Canada, the production of radium luminous devices ended in the 1960s. The use of radium in consumer products predates the establishment of regulatory control of nuclear materials in Canada. Standards today would likely not permit, permit it. Radiation hazards from luminous compounds. Okay, so we're not going to read about this because now they're talking more about Compound. When it has a radiation disposal, you get you get you get cancer, whatever radioactive radium once it gets in the body, well the health effects. How can I decrease radiation unless three factors come into play when decreasing risks of radiation? This is interesting because it's the very same as the virus, I think. Time, distance, shielding. Time. The less time a person remains in the area, the lower the dose. You could say virus here, couldn't you? 
distance, the intensity of radiation and its effects decrease as you move farther away. Same thing as a virus. Shielding. Some materials, such as lead, can act as a shield. And of course, we use shielding for the virus, too. Never open radium luminous devices. Minimize the number of radium looses, loose and device stored in one area. Store radium luminous in well ventilated areas, not frequently. And wear disposable gloves when handling them. If you have radium that is cracked or damaged, wear disposable or not carefully contain a device isolated in the location of luminous act. Do eat, drink, or smoke in the areas where the oh my gosh. What should they do if you think you've been exposed? Well, you're going to contact them, and the first thing they'll say is, well, what are you doing that got you exposed? What are you doing over there? They'll be more interested in what you're doing than, than what happened to you. Licensing information. I don't think I need some kind of license. I just need to be smart about the proper disposal. Now, there are laws that say I must now dispose of this thing, having found it to be contaminated. What are my responsibilities if a radium luminous is discovered in my facility? That's it. That's exactly what's happened to me here. Radium luminous devices can be found in the public domain in such places as antique stores, museums, junkyards, garage sales, eventually ending up in waste or scrap metal recycling facilities. If a radium luminous device enters the metal recycling process stream, equipment and products can be contaminated, resulting in significant financial impacts. Well, they would never know, would they? I mean, they would never know. If this thing could go into some some uh, recycling plant, they would just crush that thing and, and that would be the end of that. Undetected radium luminous device, oh god, this area is the matter of that. If a radium luminous device is discovered, a waste or scrap metal, the device should be isolated from the occupied areas, wearing disposable gloves, carefully contain the device, and then call this. Are they saying I should I should call? I should call the government and say I have one? It has to be accepted for disposal. I think only for disposal. As long as it is being used, taken care of uh, wisely, it can continue to exist. It's if it's developed a defect, cracked glass, glass missing, people can contact the actual material directly. Um, technical advice, so I could get technical advice, or I could read, it's probably a lot more I could read here, but I think I've read enough. Alarm response. Alarm response guidelines. Okay, well that's great. That's that's certainly putting a much more serious bent on this. Let's see the different things that they show. Aircraft. Oxygen regulator. Personnel markers. And, uh, what? Aircraft compass. It's got a cracked glass. Collection of devices containing radium luminous compounds. The clock. Well, my clock's not in here. Now the radio I have, the other radio I have, is much more radioactive than this one. And I'll tell you a story too. When I was in high school, uh, I was in physics, and the teacher brought out this uh, radiation source. He used a long pair of tongs, brought it out, stuck it on the bench got out a Geiger counter and demonstrated the radioactivity of the source that he had. It was in a container, he opened the top, and voila. Then he asked, is anybody, got an, anybody wearing an old watch? And I remember my, my good friend Victor had his dad's old watch on. He brought it up to the front and his watch was much more radioactive than the source the teacher had brought out inside his little lead bottle. What a reaction in our class. The watch never went back on, my friend. It, he never wore it again. I don't know where it went. But we were, I was, I was certainly taken aback. Even though I'm just a high school student, I knew what that was saying. Wow. So that's why I'm a little cautious here and I have a Geiger counter. Okay, enough of my stories. Let's go back to looking at this radio and reconsider everything. Okay, so is it well contained in here? Of course, nothing is perfectly contained, but yes, there's no gaping hole. It's not open at the bottom for the stuff to fall out into the, you know, fall out into here. Is it? Is it? Is it open? Is it, am I getting my fingers all over it? All this virus stuff is really uh, helping me uh, be sensitive about this. Um, I don't. I don't 
think so. Let me put a light behind it here and just really take a good look. So the light is not getting into this space. Maybe just a tiny amount there, just uh, just you know where things aren't, you know they aren't sealed. They're just pushed together. So am I going way too far here? Probably. Uh, should I be particularly concerned? Is there uh, particles of radioactive uh, radium falling on my falling here right now? I'm going to get it like that. I'm going to stick it in my in my mouth. Now I already done that. Is it too late for Jim? <laughs> Over the course of my life, I've probably encountered a number of these these kinds of clocks. If you're my age, you probably have two. Uh, you may well have exposed yourself directly to the material in here because as a kid I didn't I played around with clocks and I used to take them apart and then try to put them back together uh, could have easily handled a clock with this stuff on it I mean I know back in the day when these things were actually being made I mean there's the famous story of the uh, women who would paint paint this paint on and those women all uh, not all but a lot of them got sick and got cancer from the uh, radioactive paint well we don't have bottles of paint here and I'm not painting I'm not sticking it on my tongue or anything like that so, and I guess another thing is, frankly, as you get older in life, cancer becomes less and less a concern in terms of getting it when you're older because it takes a long time to, to, to finish you off. So, I'm not quite that old yet, though. Uh, is it okay to risk my life on this? Wow, isn't a lot of life risking issues these days? Um, no, of course not. You don't want to be cavalier with something like this. Oh my gosh, are these painted down here? I don't think so. Let's just check this. My, uh, my meter here. I think that's a little hard. Like this is not a a, a you know real uh, a real uh, precision device in terms of where the radiation is coming from. I just think the Geiger tubes are right in here. Okay, so just to demonstrate again. Why don't you come over this way and you get a little better look. Okay, up against the pointer. Well, you can see the chart it's painting there. Okay, we'll try these words down here. Even if they're painted, there's just not enough of them to. And I doubt very much these are painted. Because they want to paint the clock dial so you can see it at night in the dark. The radio, well, it might have a light in it. It, it may have a light. I'm going to turn the radio on, a little light here. And uh, the radio is not something you really want to see in the dark. And I bet you the radium paint was expensive. All the dots up there. Any of them fall off? Anything fall down? Is there anything visible laying in here? What's that little thing? There's a little thing there. Looks like it's just stuck. Don't know what it is. Looks like a little blob of dried glue is what it looks like. Okay, so now, is this thing too dangerous to work on? <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line. Should, should I just put this away and tell the owner it, he'll never see it again? It's, it's gone to the hospital, you can't come and visit it. And I'm afraid it's passed away and we're going to have to put it in a hole with a whole bunch of other... Isn't that terrible? Shame on me. I should just shut up. Okay. The answer is yes, we should continue working on this guy. We should not do anything, do not remove the glass, do not do anything like that. I wash my hands periodically. I'm supposed to be doing that anyway, even though I'm in the house here. And uh, that way, neither the virus nor the radiation will get me. And clearly the next step here in terms of repair 
is going to be, let me put this up nicely this way, back to getting this guy out. Great. Okay.